changes, the same sorts of changes that underlie the outward body surface manifestations of aging that most of us are familiar with. Graying of the hair, wrinkling of the skin, drooping of the, uh, of the face. Um, uh, I'm walking around New York lately. It's uh, amazing to me. There are certain people that seem to walk looking down at the sidewalk because their, their spine is essentially in a C shape right? Um, a hallmark, if you will, of aging that most of us are familiar with. Are these same sorts of DNA scratches associated with that? Or are we talking about people that are potentially are going to look older, but simply live longer? Uh, well, it's actually, it, you, you are as old as you look, if you want to generalize. Um, so let's start with centenarian families. These are families that tend to live over 100. When they're 70, they still look 50 or less. So it, it is a good example good indicator. It's not perfect because you can, like me, grow up in Australia and accelerate the aging of your skin. Uh, but in general, how you look. Uh, no one's ever died from gray hair, but overall you can get a sense just from the ability of skin to hold itself up, how thin it is, the number of wrinkles. That is actually, it was a great paper just came out that said that an AI system looking at the face could very accurately predict someone's age. Uh, wholeheartedly, is that development doesn't stop at age 12 or 15 or even 25, that your entire life is one de long developmental arc. Right. So in thinking about different portions of that developmental arc, the early portion of infancy and especially puberty seem like especially rapid stages of aging. And I know we normally look at babies and children and kids in puberty and we think, oh, they're so vital, they're so young. And yet the way you describe these changes in the epigenome and the way you have framed aging as a disease leads me to ask, are periods of, in, of immense vitality the same periods when we're aging faster? Yes, yes. And this is something I've never talked about, uh, at least not publicly. So this is a really good question. So those chemicals we can measure, uh, it's, it's also known as the Horvath clock. It's the biological clock. It's separate from your chronological age. So actually what I didn't mention is that when the AI looked at the faces of those people, they could pred predict their biological age, their internal age. So your skin represents the age of your organs as well. And the people that look after themselves, we can talk about how to do that later. But th there are some people that are 10, 20 years younger than other people um, biologically. And it turns out if you measure that clock from birth or even before birth, if you look at animals, there's a massive increase in age on, based on that clock early in life. Mm. So you're right. That, so that's a really important point that you, you have accelerated aging during the first few years of life, and then it goes linear towards the rest of your life. But there's another interesting thing you brought up, which is that we're finding that the genes that get messed up, that get scratched, that are leading to aging, are those early developmental genes. They come on late in life and just mess up the system. And they seem to be particularly susceptible to those scratches. So what are, what's causing the scratches? Well, we know of a couple of things in my lab we figured out. One is broken chromosomes, DNA damage, particularly cuts to the DNA breaks. So if you, if you have an X-ray or a cosmic ray, or even if you go out in the sun and you'll get your broken chromosomes, that ex accelerates the unwinding of those beautiful DNA loops that I mentioned. The other thing that accelerates aging is massive cell damage or stress. So we pinched nerves uh, and we saw that their aging process was accelerated as well. Incredible. Yeah, the, this is more of an anecdotal uh, phenomenon. It is an anecdotal phenomenon, but at this experience of in junior high school, you know, going home for a summer and you come back and high school in the U.S. usually starts eighth or ninth grade or grade eight or grade nine for your Canadians. And then some of the kids, like they grew beards over the summer or they completely matured quickly over the summer. Do you think there's any reason to believe that rates of entry into and through puberty have, can predict overall rates of aging? In other words, if a kid is a, uh, you know, a slow burner, Right? They, they basically acquire the, the traits of puberty slowly over many years. Can we make some course prediction that they are going to live a long time versus a kid that goes home for the summer and comes back a completely different organism or appearing to be a completely different organism? Like they basically age very quickly in the summer. Does that mean they're aging very quickly overall? Well, yeah, I don't want to scare anybody. Sure. There, 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 there are studies that show that the slower you take to develop it also is predictive of having a longer, healthier life. Um, and it may have something to do with growth hormone. We know that growth hormone is pro-aging. You know, anyone who's taking growth hormone, you know, pay attention. 
we know just that, look at someone who's taking growth hormone. Yeah. They, they often will acquire these um, characteristics of vitality, like improved uh, smoothness of skin, but, yeah, sure. but their whole body shape changes often. Yeah. I mean, you'll feel better, feel better for a short amount of time. You'll build up muscle, you feel great, but it's like burning your candle at both ends. Uh, ultimately, if you want to live longer, you want less of that. And the animals that, that have been generated um, and mutants that have low growth hormone, sometimes these are dwarfs, um, they live the longest by far. Uh, a guy in my lab, Michael Bonkowski, he had the longest lived mouse. A mouse typically lives about two and a bit years. He had a mouse that lived five years and he gave it caloric restrictions so fasting combined with one of these dwarf mutations, low growth hormone. Uh, I think he called it Yoda. But th this is, you know, you look at who, who lives the longest, it's the really small people. Um, this is a bit anecdotal, but it sounds, sounds like it might be true, is that the people who played the munchkins in The Wizard of Oz, many of them went on to live to, into their 90s and beyond. Really? Yeah. Huh. Amazing. And oh, there are some Laurent, Laurent dwarfs as well. There are dwarf um, mutations uh, in South America, and they seem to be protected against many of the diseases of aging. You barely ever see heart disease or cancer in these families. So I, having owned a very large dog breed, a bulldog mastiff, who lived a long life for a bulldog, 11 years, but there are many dogs that will live 12, 16 years that are smaller dogs. Can we say that there's a direct relationship between body size and longevity or it, duration of, of, of life? Well, there, there is, uh, but that doesn't mean that you're a slave to your early epigenome nor to your genome. The good news is that the epigenome can change. Those loops and structures can be modified by how you live your life. And so if, if you're born tall, and I wasn't, and I wished at the time I, I did grow, um, but no matter what size you are, you can have a bigger impact on your life than anything your genes give you. 80% is epigenetic, not genetic. Can we go a little deeper into what the, these scratches are? Uh, is it the way that the DNA are packed into a cell? Is it the way that uh, they're spaced? Uh, what, is, what are the scratches that you're referring to? So DNA is six foot long. So if you join chromosomes together, you get a six foot per cell. So there's enough to go to the moon and back eight times in your body. And it has to be wrapped up to exist in, inside us. But it's not just wrapped up willy-nilly. It's not just a bundle of string. It's wrapped up very carefully in ways that dictates which genes are switched on and off. And when we're developing in the embryo, the cell marks the DNA with chemicals that says, okay, this gene is for a nerve cell. You, you cell, will stay a nerve cell for the next 100 years, if you're lucky. Don't turn into a skin cell. That would be bad. Uh, and those chemicals, uh, there are many different types of chemicals, but one's called methylation. Those little methyls will mark which songs get played for the rest of your life. And there are other marks that change daily. But in total, what we're saying is that the body controls the genome through the ability to mark the DNA and then compact some parts of it, silence those genes, don't read those genes, and open others, keep others open, that should stay open. And that pattern of genes that are silent and open, silent, open, is what dictates the cell's type, the cell's function. And then the scratches are the disruption of that. So genes that were once silent, and you could say it's a gene that is involved in skin, it's starting to come on in the brain, shouldn't be there, but we see this happen. And vice versa, the gene might get shut off over time during aging. Cells over time lose these structures, lose their identity, they forget what they're supposed to do, and we get diseases. We call that aging, uh, and we can measure that. 